Dear Jonathan, thank you very much for the invitation and the possibility to share with you my experience of 3D imaging. And to be very honest, I'm a surgeon, so I'm a user of 3D imaging for surgical purposes. I'm not a radiologist, and I know there are many specialists among you, so they are much more deeper in the knowledge of technology and uh, physical things. So take care, I'm a surgeon, and I will show you just honestly our experience and how we use it in everyday routine. And when we prepared the lecture, because I will show you some cases from our everyday working station, we found out that all our cases were done in the low dose mode, although I was expecting them to be in the high definition mode. So this was a very funny recognition we had during the preparation. And you will see that you can see all the clear, um, very fine details, even with reduced radiation exposure for, for the patients. So now let's start. This is my hospital. I'm coming from Hamburg. There's not the summer anymore. It's just more rainy. If you ever um, be in the northern of Germany, you're very welcome to visit our department because we are a huge department, a very young department, but very dynamic. And um, it's always a pleasure for us to have guests from, from outside Germany at our um, place. So we have three topics in, on research. So besides tumor biology, because we deal with a lot of cancer cases, we have biomaterials, tissue engineering in the lab. And of course, the 3D lab imaging, planning, virtual surgery is a big topic in maxillofacial surgery in Germany, in Europe, and I think all over the world. And because in Germany we are double qualified, we have also always the dental view on, on our patients and our topics. If we look a little bit more detailed on the 3D lab, what we are dealing with, we have a navigation system coming from Brain Lab. We use some, some planning tools for implantology, and we will go a little bit deeper in detail in this topic. We, use, well, we are trying to establish some um, virtual planning tools for our orthognatic cases. To be honest, this is not everyday routine in our department. Also, because of the cost, the financial aspect in these um, CAT CAM guides is not, um, we have to discuss even with our patients in Germany. So, we are dreaming of this and we want to establish this, but this is not done really yet. And we use these new CAT CAM technologies for our free flaps, and I will show you some examples at the end what is all possible if you handle your DICOM data properly. We have the following um, technical feasibilities available at our department. We have two cone beams. We started with the Morita, and this was mainly driven by our ENT colleagues, to be honest, because they said by this time when we had to decide, this was the only device able to, to image the inner ear properly. This is not true anymore, and to have a support from Japan is a horror. So um, I would strongly, and that's why we choose a second one from coming from Finland, from Europe, and they are much more supporting us if we have any questions, problems, anything happens. So this is our preferred system, and this is our, let's say, like dinosaur um, still in the outpatient area. We have something um, available for intraoperative imaging. It's the same physical principle from Siemens. It's a C-arm with 3D technology. Very nice if you have it available, but coming a little bit out of time now. It's coming in the market, I think, 2003, so 10 years ago. So image quality and field of view is not like state of the art anymore, but Siemens is still running the system. We have the navigation system. We're making more than 1,000 cone beam scans a year. And I just put some examples from our, from our Plan Maker working station with me to show you some really everyday cases to share the possibilities of imaging. Uh, until now, we are doing more than 2,000 panoramic views. Um, maybe when the ultra low dose um, protocols are available in Germany, we will change here a little bit. But to be honest, the cone beam scans are not covered by their general health insurance in Germany, but the panoramic views and the CT scans are. This is a, something like a political discussion with the radiologists, because in Germany we do the cone beams by ourselves and the CTs are done by the, by the radiologists, and at the end it's a question of the, where the money goes. So at the moment cone beam is a private, it has to be paid by the patient, and the panoramic and CTs are um, reimbursed by the general health insurance. Cone beam and um, the radiologists of you will all know was introduced in 1998 um, 
and it was uh, becoming commercially available in the States in uh, 2001. It was mainly coming from Italy. It was the new term device, was the first one in the market. Now it's uh, also a dinosaur and um, they had a very long time, it was the only adequate system, but nowadays it's a little bit um, running out of the market. The physical difference, and Jonathan showed you already between the CT scan and the cone beam, is that we have here a cone beam and a flat panel detector in comparison to the um, fan beam and the CT scanner. So what are the characteristics of cone beam devices nowadays? First of all, and this was shown by Jonathan also, we have a very low level of radiation exposure. And this is in our field very important because we have patients pre-operative, post-operative, during follow-up, we have kids like for an ortho treatment, they need a repeated imaging. So this is a really a point to consider when we send patients for imaging. Of course, we can visualize high contrast structures, and this is the topic we're talking about, teeth and bone. The soft tissues, this is not a topic for conium. Soft tissues are more and more replaced by only MRI, even not CT. So if we have a primary cancer of the oral cavity nowadays, we do an MRI for tumor staging, and we make a an, an cone beam scan for regarding the bony invasion of the tumor. And then we fuse both images. So this is the way we are going through at the moment. Of course, and this is something you have to consider if you want to buy a system like this, that there are different fields of use and in some devices you have a real panoramic view included. But, and this is the big advantage with this cone beam coming available to you, it gives you a three DICOM data set available. I heard about that in Israel and some countries around, you used to get some printouts from your cone beam scan, or something like, like papers at the end. But believe me, if you switch that you're getting used to use the data like a CD and you import it in your software, you have amazing more possibilities to deal with your diagnostic possibilities, not rely only on the papers and the printouts. And this is something like the key message I want to transport to you this evening, that you even as a dentist, as a surgeon, can use the data interactively and you get much more out of it. When we started to think about dealing with data, it was in the navigation system coming around 2000 or 1998 to the maxillofacial area from the neurosurgical field. So we had uh, to deal with pre-operative DICOM data sets. We had to prepare our data with some segmentation of tumors to use this intraoperatively. And this was the starting point for us coming from navigation system that as a surgeon we have to deal with data. Because when we ask our radiologist colleagues in the hospital, they are not interested to increase their working load because the surgeon has a special wish or a dream what, what would be possible. They say to us, you have to do it by yourself. And they are right because if I want a segmentation of a tumor, I'm the surgeon having to look at where are my structures I'm interested in, where are the borders, the safety margins, and so on and so on. So we were forced by the technology development to get used to DICOM data. Before this, I did not know what DICOM is. Now we are dealing every day with this, and I strongly encourage you, even if your everyday work, to do so. So this was the first one, the dinosaur from Newton coming. Then there were many, many different... Um, devices in the market. You can use laying patients, sitting patients, standing patients. You have different kinds of detectors. And this was a huge development coming out in the market. We had the first generation of cone beam scanners and this was the classic indications we did with the relation between the wisdom tooth and the, and the nerve and mandibular canal. Here's some signs of osteomyelitis. Even by this time, it was really gray. We were able to detect these small areas of osteolysis. Here, the blowout fracture of the orbital floor, psychomatic fracture in some some er earlier implant planning. So this is where we started and we were satisfied. We were happy with these images by this time. Of course, and this is the next advantage, if you make a reconstruction in the multiplanar um, levels, you have always the same image quality. In the older CT scanners, you have the stepping artifacts. Here you have the same image quality in all levels. And you cannot see in this image, but you know that the level of metal artifacts is also reduced compared to CT scanners. And this is very much important regarding the oral cavity with all the metal from the dental restorations in place. 
So today in Germany, we have more than 16 manufacturers, not systems, manufacturers offering cone beam for dental, even four manufacturers for ENT questions. So that we have a huge variety of systems available. So it's a question of image quality, radiation exposure, fields of view, price and support. And I told you about my experience with support from Japan. So in my point of view, and this is what I'm dreaming of, I do not have this Pro Max Max available. Even in Germany, it's everything is a question at the end of money. We have the mid available, but this is from uh, the, the, the dream of uh, uh, the, the, the thing of my dreams because we have a high resolution. We have the complete skull included in one scan. We can the 3D photo include. We have a panoramic view include, and it is, uh, this needs the same space like a panoramic device. Regarding radiation exposure, it is very crucial not to, to judge the, the values absolutely because it is a question what you compare with. If you compare an old CT scanner with the newest cone beam scanner, of course the newest cone beam scanner has an advice. You always should, when you look at the papers, you have to look who's financing the who's supporting the authors because these are all you know these are some conflicts of interest in these data always what level of machines are compared with each other whose group is supported by which company but the general in the, the general result of all these papers is that cone beam has a significant less radiation exposure level with a comparable image quality to ct scan if I'm not getting killed now by the radiologist, this is still true, and this is my knowledge. So, but it depends what you compare with, so the level of difference has to be judged very carefully. So what kind of image quality can we expect today? And you saw some very impressive images at the beginning. So again, you have the same image quality in all reconstruction levels in your image, first. Second, the level of metal artifacts, and it was a very good question coming from the audience because we had two TMJ prostheses in this case in place, heavy metal work in a, in a face, and the level, metal, uh, the level of metal artifacts, I would say, was acceptable, but they were there. It was a good, very good question. So, but it's, if you do a CT scan throughout this, it will be like destroying your image. So they are there, but they are less. So, and of course, we can do these like, like 3D endoscopic views. You can play around and we will do so with you together with Jonathan because he's more familiar with the software than I do. So we will do it together later on when we go to the data sets together. Of course, you can add, and this is very in interesting for us, for orthognatic cases, for aesthetic cases with like nasal corrections, that you have a really 3D photo in the same device. First of all, it is much cheaper than if instead of buying a separate device and you need, do not need a separate space for this and you can include it in and fuse it with your imaging as well. You, but you can also do it separately. So this is very attractive. And of course, if we are doing a cone beam, we want to get a panoramic view because we are used to this view. We want to see the panoramic reconstruction immediately after the scanning because this is the view we are all used to and we were educated with. And of course, the, the, the data management, because you're producing a lot of data with these cone beams, and I put it with an external hard drive with me because they are killing my, my, um, my MacBook. Otherwise, so this is the question, you have to find a solution for your space, how to storage your data that you can take it, how to share your data with, if you have a referring colleague, you're sending just a patient for, for imaging and you send the patient back, how to handle the data between your colleagues. So now, and this is in Germany very crucial, who's taking the image is to, responsible to make a, like a written result of, of all the image data and that's, if you make a scan of the whole skull, you have to look at the whole skull, if there are any pathologies. So even the dentist making a full skull of a cone beam has to look at all the relevant structures in his data volume. And of course, this makes some dentists, even in Germany, afraid of using a cone beam and preferring to send them to a radiologist, making the, because they take res the responsibility of all the findings within the data. So of course you have to take care about the anatomy 
of all the regions you're visualizing. So if we look at the teeth and the mandible, you can clearly see all the, of course, the maxillary sinuses, the hard tissues of the teeth. You can see the nasal structures. You can see the palatal process, the maxilla. And so you, you, if you do a big scan, you have a lot of, of areas to address, to look at from the radiology and diagnostic point of view. Especially if you look at the TMJ, it is clear you see only the bony structures and not the cartilages. So this is ideally then combined in the TMJ problematic case with an MRI scan, as you all know. Of course, the orbit is very um, crucial for us in trauma cases. I will show you later some um, some cases, because even the thin bone of the orbital floor of all the paranasal sinuses of the medial orbital wall is clearly imaged and visualized, so you can clearly judge whether there's a small fracture or not, a small fragment displaced, so everything is clearly up to, to see for you. The maxilla, again, you can clearly see all the different roots, the, um, the root canals, so the anatomy is very crucial for you to have in mind if you're doing a full face scan. Except um, for the zygoma with all the processes, the regions, and of course if you, if you image all the bones, you have to look at them. And the zygomatic arch at the end. Maxillary sinus also, and nasal and frontal bone. So now we are through the bony anatomy of the facial skeleton very, very quickly. So now coming to the indications when we are doing a, C a cone beam scan. And first of all, of course, there can be some dental questions. Um, there can be some apical alterations, root fractures, root resorption, impaired eruption of teeth, the relationship with surrounding structures, the mandibular canal, maxillary sinus, neighboring teeth, the shape of crowns and roots, root configuration and endo treatment, but I'm not an endodontologist, but it can be used for this in the high definition note if you image only a um, small section of the, of the jaw, and of course with ankylosed teeth. So this would be the dental indications where you can use a cone beam with a small volume, only the area you're interested in. You do not have to scan the whole skull if you have a dental question. But if you scan the whole skull, you have to look at everything. Just some examples. Here you can clearly see, and these are only some single sections out of it, the sinusitis, and here you have this periapical lesion of this molar with a big cyst around it. So this is clearly visualizing the reason for this chronic sinus problem. So, and here you can clearly judge the, your treatment making an apicoectomy or extracting the tooth and later replace it by an implant. But you can also visualize the very discrete findings. You can see here that the endo was a little bit too much regarding the apex and of course in, um, into, uh, into the maxillary sinus and you see this discrete inflammation of the basal mucous membranes. So this is clearly and the reason for the complaints of the patients is you can show the patient on the screen, we find your solution and we have to deal with. So this is the big benefit. You can put your patients to the screen, show him in all dimensions and explain what you're doing and why you are doing. And of course, if you later want to put your implants, you see this bony septum, that this can make your sinus floor elevation a little bit more challenging. So if you image this, just look at all the structures you're seeing. Even in cases where you have these periodontitis, you see the destruction is a little bit gray, the image, because it's a panoramic reconstruction, and you can clearly judge which tooth has a good prognosis or which, which one should better be extracted and replaced later on. In, in case of retained teeth, if you have something like this, you can clearly um, judge the position, whether the ankylosis is present or not. This is not possible in 100% of the cases. But in some, the root shape can be visualized in more dimensions to have an idea whether it makes sense to make an orthodontic treatment with the tooth or not. And of course, if you want to surgically approach to, the, to this tooth, you can judge you do it from the palatal way or from the vestibular way, as all of your surgeons know. If you open both sides, it's not so a good idea because the patient will suffer some days longer. In wisdom teeth, in my department, and I've shown you my department, we have a clear rule because I have a lot of residents. If ever the root tip of a wisdom teeth 
tooth overlaps the caudal border of the mandibular canal, like in this case, this is an indication for a cone beam. If the root tip is not longer than the caudal border, it is not, not necessary in all the cases. Some do to feel more comfortable. But if the root tip is below the lower border, it can have a hook or grow around the nerve canal. And this is something you have to know before surgery, because then you can destroy the nerve very easily. So very clear, if the root is in the panoramic view, over the caudal border of the mandibular canal, this is an indication for 3D imaging. And it's up to you whether you use a cone beam or a CT scan. But if it would be my young daughter, I would strongly recommend a cone beam because of the radiation exposure. I do not know whether she gets a fracture two years later and again 3D imaging and again 3D imaging. So reduce the radiation as much as possible. And as you can see here, you can clearly judge the relationship between the root tip and the nerve canal. That does not make surgery very, very easy, but you know your plan, you know the danger, and you can show the patient, and then you can judge together whether to leave the tooth in place, and if you go for surgery, you have a clear idea what to, what to look at. So, this is now the point where we could start with the first data set. I had the, the information that there's planned a one coffee break, because I have much more slides to go to. Jonathan, what is your recommendation to make the, now the coffee break or to continue a little bit? <laughs> then you have to come upstairs because this is something we share together now. Just a quick information that we have a victim of physical violence because many patients in our department have this um, history. She has a limited mouth opening. We will see no fracture but we will f find some incidental findings. And this is exactly the point. If you make an image, you have to look at every structure you're, you're getting in your volume. And now we have the second one. Yes, it should, no? Yeah. yeah. But it's with the cable. I can, please, I can talk about it. So this is the one we wanted to reconstruct the root shape. see that our voxel size was 400 microns, so this meaning low dose protocol, not the high definition protocol. So to show you what is our everyday routine. So as I said before, we had no fracture in this. We, we checked, of, of course, everything. But we had a very nice relationship of her um, wisdom tooth with, regarding the manipular canal to explain to the patient if ever a surgeon wants to extract this tooth to um, take care of the nerve. So and maybe you can, can mark the nerve that we see clearly the relationship and just look how fast you can get this information out of this if you're used to the software, of course. Just to check in the, in the um, sections that the marking is located within the nerve canal. And then you can clearly see in this three-dimensional, and again, low-dose protocol, not high-definition, everyday case. This is the information you get of a trauma scanning for mandibular fracture. It can, you can clearly show the patient that the nerve is not running through the root tips, but the roots are located lingually, and the nerve is on the vestibular side. This would make extraction easy if you know before, OK? I think, and then the upper jaw, we had some impacted canines. Just to show quickly that there were some teeth of pain. And of course, there would, would be ideally to, to make it with also treatment in the dental arch because the root shape is very nice. So there's no reason not to, to start also treatment after surgical exposure of the canines. Okay. Any questions? We were talking about whether we do it as a quiz, but then we will run completely out of time. So we will give you some hints what to look at, because then you get the information first. Yes, please. please. Yeah. This one. Yes. That one. Yeah. Maybe it's this one no. because this is. 
מישהו מהצוות? This is something you have to, um, exactly, you have to deal. If you have an endo question, you should not use the ultra low dose protocol, for sure. So this is something you have adapt. What is your <coughs> clinical question? And then as low as, as possible, and as, as small the field of view as possible. Completely right. Okay, let's continue. Yeah. But maybe we switch off this light, because the imaging. Yeah, someone went to look for some for the okay. so. Okay, we, can, we go to the next case. Um, she has not um, uh, physical violence at home. She had a removal of the left lower wisdom tooth and was coming to our emergency department because out of pain, persistent pain, limited mouth opening, and we find some, some remnants of the tooth in the imaging. That was Jennifer, right? Yeah, yeah Jennifer. It was the left lower making the complaints, the problems. And if you look at the coronal, um, the coronal, you see that there's something not normal in the coronal. You see it better? Yeah. Come forward. There you see that there's something inside the outer cortex of the mandible. And if you look at the 3D reconstruction, I do have, to have, I have only two hands. Um, you see? You see that here is a remnant of the tooth, and it's like, like a small sequester with it. So this is the reason for her complaints in this region. But if you look at the whole data, you have to tell the patient something else. On the right first upper molar, we had a big periapical inflammation. You can even see on the 3D imaging. Maybe not in the transparency mode. Yeah. Here you see the destruction of the, of the bone already. And this was something like an inci incidental finding during this imaging again. And if you look at the sections of this tooth, you clearly see this big inflammation around the root tips. So this is something, if you image a volume, you have to look at everything and explain everything to the patient. And of course, you have some responsibility if you use these devices. But this can be very helpful to, to, to um, get for explanation of the patient. Good, and you can clearly judge which root is um, guilty and which uh, which is not. Okay. Continue. Okay. Now I I continue and then we start with the implant planning. Okay. I'm sorry, I'm a little bit handicapped. Usually I'm, I'm more dynamic. So in Germany. Implantology is the main topic for cone beam scans because implantology is a private issue. The patient has to pay by themselves. So the cone beam scan is just included in the package. So this is a big difference to regarding all the other questions. Um, so besides dental questions, implantology is the next area for, for indication. Of course, we can, of course, we can plan the implant placement. We can, in the regions we are interested in, the assessment of the bone availability regarding quantity and quality. We can, in the lower um, jaw, we can look at the mandibular canal and the exit point of the nerve. We can plan our implants and we will show you. We can generate and receive a drilling template if we want to. And of course, we can assess the situation postoperatively. And if we get some kind of signs of peri-implantitis, we can judge the extent of bony destruction. If we have a situation like this in the lateral mandible, these situations are challenging or can be challenging. You know the lateral mandible and the lateral maxilla in implant placement can be not so easy, but, and I will show you some, some helps for solutions. 
In our department, again, we are a teaching hospital, we have a lot of residents, we have the strong rule that all our implants has to be planned three-dimensionally, that my residents are forced to look at the data, to look at the patient, to know exactly what they're going to do during surgery. With one exception, with the exception of interforaminal implants in the atrophic edentulous mandible, because there nothing can happen. You need, in almost 100% of the cases, you have enough bone for implants, and you look at the nerves, so you have clearly the area for drilling. So this is the only exception in my department. All, in all other cases are used with an intraoperative guidance and we use it only for the pilot drilling. Only the first drilling is guided through these devices, not a full guided procedure. And in my opinion, this is t totally sufficient because I have the starting point, I have the vector, the direction of drilling, and all other things I know from my planning how deep and how thick the implant can get. And usually we use an open approach for implant placement. There are many, many different other solutions. This is how we do it. And as I told you, especially in the lateral areas of both jaws, cone beam scanners or cone beam imaging is of great value. In the lateral maxilla, if the, if the teeth are gone for some months or some years, in nearly all of the cases, you need some kind of augmentation or you use the new very short implants. But in most of the cases, there are not enough bone, there's not enough bone to put a 10 millimeter implant. So, of course, you can have to judge the amount of available bone regarding if you can do the augmentation, the sinus flow elevation, and the implant placement in one step, or you have to divide it in two steps remaining regarding. Uh, or in respect to the remaining bone that you get the primary stability of your implant. Furthermore, the next question is if I have ever uh, any sign of sinusitis. If you have a sinusitis and you make a sinus floor elevation, this patient will return to the emergency department the following day because this will, ex will get a dramatic um, exacerbation of his sinusitis. So this is something to look before you go in for implant placement that the sinuses are clear. And as I showed you before, if you have a bony septum there and you want to make a lateral sinus floor elevation, it is very helpful to know that there is a, a septum and where it is positioned. And then you can address it with your surgical techniques. So these are the three reasons why I say I feel much more comfortable if I do it an implant in the lateral atrophy, uh, atrophied maxilla after cone beam and instead of without a cone beam. Whether you use your drilling guide is another topic, but you have the information available in, in three dimensions and you can really have a good idea what you're going to do. Whether you use the drilling guide, again, is another topic, but you have a planning and you have looked at the data before. In the lateral mandible, I showed you an example situation before. Of course, the first question is, where's the nerve? And depending on the level of the nerve regarding to your available bone and the occlusal plane you want to reach with your crowns later on, you have, in many cases, you, you have to find a solution. You can make some augmentation, you can make a nerve lateralization if you have no vertical problem. And of course, nowadays from Dense by Astra there, we have these profile implants with an oblique surface to, um, to avoid any lateral augmentation. So, or you use again short implants. Short implants are coming nowadays and getting more and more popular and could be a solution in these challenges. So nowadays, if we do go in for, for an implant placement, first of all, we have to think about with the patient, what would be the prosthetic solution at the end? What is the, the goal we are, we are going to, to reach together with the prosthodontics or the general dentists? So this is something completely different even from the surgical point of view and it is very crucial or very helpful that if you make an implant planning like we will do in a few seconds, then you can, all, the, all the three teams can join. The one who's making the imaging, the surgeon and the prosthodontic colleague and everyone is looking at the same moment at the images using a web meeting or something like this and you make a compromise and a clear judgment what is the plan for this patient. And of course then we make Again, we would do a cone beam scan and then we can optimize, look at the available bone structures, the neighboring structures, and so on and so on. 
And of course, this is nowadays called backward planning. I can strongly recommend this because the results regarding aesthetics, functions, patient satisfaction are much better. If we look at the official guidelines, and I was telling you what is in my department the rule, this is not um, covered by the uh, guideline of the German Society for Dentistry for 3D imaging and navigation guidance in implantology. And of course, like all over the world, if you look at guidelines, they are very, very weak because if ever any one of us has to go to court because of a patient that's not happy, um, then they look at this and they will find any solution you, you're searching for. Of course, they say possible indications. This is the first weak word for 3D imaging might be. So, and then it goes on. It was translated by myself from German, but in German it's exactly the same. Significant anatomic variation. What is a significant anatomic variation? All patients without teeth has some kinds of significant significant anatomic variation, unsure results of the previous augmentation, unsure visualization of important neighboring structures on conventional x-rays. If you have a sinusitis in the conventional x-ray, it can be difficult to judge 100%. Incidentally detected pathologies, previous diseases, and so on and so on. So meaning, in the guidelines you can do whatever you do. You can do it with two dimensions, but I want to, to share my experience with you that three-dimensional makes everything easier because you have a 100% plan when you're going to the OR with your patient, you have an idea what you're doing and what situation you will find during surgery. And again, regarding guidance, possible indications for navigation support, and this means also guidance, implant insertion might be, support of minimal invasive techniques, after complex bone reconstruction support in case of difficult prosthetic situation, special concepts, special concepts can be everything. So again, these guidelines are very, very weak. So our working, um, our planning model or workflow is that we make a model of our patients. We do not need this uh, radio pack appliance for the cone beam scan because there are some softwares out in the market you can do it virtually. So if you have remaining teeth that you can create um, these um, by on your computer, so the patient can be imaged immediately without <coughs> any guidance in in the play, in the mouth. Then we do the cone beam. Then we send the data and. Uh, on our laptop or to the web to a company who's sharing the software with us. These are the two possibilities, but you can do it yourself on your computer and we will show you how to do so. And then um, we prefer this with a web meeting and then you get your guidance at the end. And if you receive the guidance, you have a clear idea where to drill your holes, how long and how thick your implants can be what to expect regarding the bony level and at the end surgery is much more relaxed you do not know have any kind of unsureness what what's going on and it's safer for you as a as a surgeon safer for the patient and of course surgical time is reduced jonathan and i think we will go now through the planning together First look at the excess slices, you see there's a, a sinusitis on the right side, okay. There's also a sinusitis on the left side. This is now detected, but we want to go with the implant planning with you. So we have to ignore this for the moment, but I will never go in for surgery in a case like this, not for, for implant placement with the sinus flow elevation. And if you're looking here now through the available bone, whoops, yeah. step by step. You see, and we can measure this in two dimensions, what is the available height of the bone. And this is one to one. There's no magnification factor anymore like in the 2D imaging. What is our result? So it's four, four millimeters. So four millimeters is enough to put uh, the implant in the same setting with the um, sinus flow elevation. Four millimeters are enough for the primary stability. So you can say to the patients, we have to do some augmentation, but the good news is we have only one surgery. So 
usually in one place an implant of about eight to 10 millimeters, let's say we take a 10 millimeter implant and the diameter may be around four and in company from the database that you, you are used to. I know there are many companies out in the market and especially in Israel, you have some own companies. So let's have a look and you have a database and you can clearly select the, the available implants from your preferred company. So there it is, and you can place it, and then you check it in all the others. Maybe I was too fast, sorry. So you can clearly judge whether the length is um, <coughs> like you want the diameter. This is crucial during drilling, and. Of course, you can check uh, the, the implant around you that there's bo uh, sufficient bone on all surfaces of your implant, especially the palatal side that is not surgically um, totally exposed in, uh, in some cases. So if you know go in for, for a drilling guide or not, it's up to you, but you have a clear idea when you look where to start with your implant drilling, what to expect. And if you go a little bit more <coughs> anteriorly and put a second implant there, and you see how quickly it is. It's, uh, it's uh, some minutes on the computer, you print it out or you send a PDF to, to your colleague and everyone has the same level of information. Oh, is this a separate model or what? This is a model from Plan Maker included. Plan Maker separate or is it just separate? I have to ask you whether it's an own development or coming from materialized. Own. It's own, it's not materialized. Not materialized. some very strong patterns materialize. All the companies using producing any kind of guides has to send it to materialize all over the world. It's, it's a good story. <laughs> so we put the second implant a little bit more anterior. Of course, here we have enough bone for regarding the length, but the diameter could be a little bit crucial. What is our available bone in width? It was four. 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 Yeah. So we need some bone around the implant or we go in for augmentation. And this is something you can judge during your planning as well. And as we all know, the implants do not have to be 100% parallel because of our individual abutments. These times are over, so th there we can use the bone available in our drawers. So this is quickly done, easily done, and you can use it with your own implant designs <coughs> that you used to use in your dental practice and in your routine. Any questions regarding? Let's say so, it is as easy as it looks like. You know, you can use it tomorrow in your practice and it will work. I, that's something that I can strongly encourage you. If you're already using cone beam scans, you just get the CD and import it in your software, or you sit on your, with your radiologist on the web or on the table and make it together with him because you have a lot of benefits for your everyday work. Okay? Yes, please. Plameka are also coming up with this, uh, with um, putting together information from Combing and uh, CADCAM camera. So basically you will have the CADCAM scan with which bo scans both the soft tissue and the hard tissue and you could place it on top of the CBCT image.
That's a, that's a very good point regarding the stitching. First of all, the stitching is a question if you're talking about the large volumes, not the small volumes, because the small volumes where you, like in an in a endo case, where you want to really have the high definition um, image quality, this is catch, um, um, catch up with one scan. If you do it like a full face scan and you have this uh, stitching of two images, very good. Usually you're in the low dose profile, and as I told you, all our images from our database are low dose, uh, and I didn't know before. So this is the low dose image quality. What is crucial, if the patient is moving during this time, then of course you get some moving artifacts, and this could is the main reason why in the stitching data sets you have to repeat the scan. And this is something that the nurses or the assistant who's doing the image has to clearly explain to the patient that after the first rotation he has to stand in the same position not to think it's finished i go out so because this is the main source for to have uh, to for the to, for the necessity sorry to repeat a, a stitched scan but it's not the topic in these small volumes where you want to have the high image quality like in an endo case because this volume is catch up in one time did I get your question? Yes. If I may comment on that, yes, please, please. Important, the question that we have here. Yeah. I completely object to stitching with smaller copies, especially when you have machines like the the from from flat data that you have the possibility the possibility to use smaller copies and bigger copies. That there is no reason to use smaller copies and to do two scans and stitch them together. There is always Yeah. Don't send your patient to, to, to do two smaller for me and teach you know, There are always errors there. I, I totally agree with you, but it, as you know, this is a, at the end it's a question of money because the larger the scannable volume, the more expensive the devices are. Yeah. So this is something you know. In Germany, we have <laughs> in Germany we are, we are facing the same challenge, and in Germany we are we are, so, we are trying to solve this problem. If a group of dentists or colleagues is sharing one device together, so if five of you saying, you know, I have. 10 cases per month, and all of you have 10 cases per month, and you're sharing a device together, then it's a, you know, it's a completely different um, calculation. And in Germany, especially the ENT, ENT colleagues are going this way because for one, all wants the high level machines, of course the lower volumes are cheaper, and then it's the question how, what, what, what you're doing. And I would strongly recommend get the, the, like, the possibility to get um, access to a high-level machine and own only a part of it. That's much easier and much more attractive. And in Germany, this is the way we are solving this problem. We have also financial limitations, like all over the world. Of course, it's not standing in your practice, but in your, the practice of your friend. And it has to be a very gentle agreement among you, but it works. And in Germany, it works. Okay. Exactly.
Yes, but if you're thinking a little bit more years in the future, let's say three to five years, and we have the idea that the, the classical panoramic view will be su substituted by a cone beam ultra dose. So, you know, if you jump on the train right now, the danger is that in two years the system is old. It's like with the computers. If you buy a laptop today, tomorrow it's old. With, so this is exactly the point how to solve this challenge. But if you're doing... A, a, if you're choosing a machine with only the, the possibility of small volumes, you have a limitation, you not get rid really of it, because the stitching is not a 100% perfect solution, as you said, totally correct. Okay? Coffee break or continue? We can go through all the slices together, I have no problem with this. Okay, we do so. So as I, as I told you before, uh, first of all, thank you very much that some of you returned after the coffee break. This is always the challenge to have a coffee break in between the lecture, but um, hopefully we are not alone. So again, this is the principle of these drilling guides with the, with the implant planning, as I showed you before. And of course, you can use the cone beam scan even after insertion of the implants and then again, the low level of metal artifacts give you a nice idea about the augmentation area and the position of the implant. And of course, if you have a peri-implantitis, you can see, clearly judge the amount of bone loss around the implants, as in this case shown. In hospitals or in, in bigger clinics, uh, one big topic for cone beam is traumatology, because as I said before, these are young patients, you need repeated scanning, and um, we can clearly judge the whole um, mid-face in these um, images. So traumatology is really a very beneficial area for cone beam scanning. If a gentleman like this comes to the emergency department, we would all agree that this is highly suspected mid-facial fracture. The patient, of course, has no idea what was happening, but when we see the patient on the chair, this is our first thought. And I'm sorry that this is in German, but I just want to clearly demonstrate our algorithm we are using in our emergency room nowadays. If we have a suspected mid-facial fracture like this patient, and we have any signs of neurology, meaning central nervous system involvement, like um, he does not know what was going on, or he has something blurred vision, or anything like this that we are suspecting involvement of the central nervous system, or we have a suspected retrobulbar hematoma. This is clearly the case for classical CT scanning, no question. But all other cases that have no clinical signs of neurologic involvement of the central nervous system, these are cases we do with a cone beam nowadays. So again, in the emergency department, if we have any signs of neurologic involvement, central nervous system involvement in these cases, Clearly, they have to undergo CT scan. <laughs> Signs of retrobulbar hematoma, clearly CT scan, or directly to the OR. All other fractures we scan with a cone beam nowadays. So again, we have a medical history. We want to switch, but not to this patient. Yeah. <laughs> We have a fracture of the, of the medulla angle here, and if we look at this image, we can clearly see that this tooth, the, I think it's the wisdom, or no, the second molar, so the second molar that is uh, severely affected, so this has to be um, removed during surgery. We had a nice uh, 3D reconstruction of this tooth, maybe we can repeat it if we get an idea about this tooth. And of course, if the patient or the parents of the patient see this, they have to agree that this is, makes no sense to preserve this tooth. Of course, we get a, the risk of um, 
osteomyelitis in the fractured area if you leave something in. So this is for surgery, very crucial to take this tooth out during surgery. So this was the only fracture site, and you can clearly see all the fracture line in the dislocation, the slight dislocation. Okay, we continue. Can you presume about the mandibular nerve? It's a very good question. We go, go back. Because of the amount of dislocation, this is not a big topic. If we have severe dislocation, this could be a topic. But of course, we can, in the cone beam, like in the CTs, can only visualize the nerve canal, not the nerve itself. But we can clearly get an idea um, where the, the canal is located in this. And you see, in the sagittal views, that it's located below. No, it's better on the coronal. Better on the coronal. You see? Perfect. Yeah, there's a fracture line. Of course, if the mandible is fractured, the, the nerve can, uh, has to be affected. The, the question is what happened to the nerve? We do not know. So, but here you see this, that it is infected. And this can clearly explain to the patient why he feels some numbness after trauma in his, in his lower lip, no question. Perfect, we continue. Maybe the next one is not coming too late. So this was we did during surgery, like Sean P, one mini plate from intraoral, removing of the tooth. And usually nowadays we are making these with these IMF screws, not with uh, arch bars anymore. So this is um, a case from our department. I think he's coming to the next one. Um, this was a 70-year-old male. Here we have um, a th three piece or um, fracture of the mandible and three pieces, and they are not dislocated. But, and we have some moving artifacts as well because this was a 70-year-old uh, patient in the emergency department. But you can clearly see all the fractures, although they are not dislocated. Okay, if we go in. We lean. And low dose again, not um, high dose. So, as we know, this is the easiest fracture to see. Maybe we can have a look on the coronals. So, this is the first side here, I think. Yeah. The other one is a vertical one within the, the capital of the manure here. And the third one is uh, very typically in the, in the anterior part of the mandible. Here you can see clearly. And the third one. And the other one, maybe Excel is better. Can we go here for? And of course, surgically, we did only this structure with uh, two mini plates and uh, treated the other ones conservatively. Okay, so you can clearly see, although the image quality is not perfect, and um, this was a stitch volume because we had only the mid um, um, blood maker stitch volume, young patients with some moving artifacts in between, and we had th um, three non displaced fractures. We can clearly visualize all areas where we had clinical signs of a fracture that there are fractures present. Perfect. Okay. I think now we, oh, Denise is the last one, but maybe, maybe we can continue because this is, but this one is nice. We take Erich, a very old man. <coughs> Again with a, with a um, suspected mandibular fracture. The problem in our department is if we have a device that's running so regularly with companies, someone has to make all the reports, some of the residents, and this is really a lot of work. We're producing a lot of data, and someone has to look at all the data and make the written reports. So if we look at the patient here, it is a non-displaced fracture, and here you can clearly, you can increase a little bit. Is that 
shared the master's <coughs> place structure in a 91-year-old patient here on this area, here it's structured but non-displaced. And of course, we treated this without anything, just soft diet because it was non-displaced. And if we go in for surgery, you know this needs a big plate from extra oil approach in a 90-year-old one old grandpa uh, who's not had the same chewing forces than we do. So adapt your uh, treatment algorithm. Although some of my residents, of course, wants to make surgery 24 hours a day, this is not the case for surgery. And to be honest, this was the follow-up scan that we controlled that there was nothing um, negative going on. So here you can see clearly the, the non-displaced fractures. So even for these cases, cone beam is very useful. And low dose. And low dose, yes, as I learned today. So I think now the next case is, I think it's coming very, uh, very uh, fast. <laughs> we had now traumatology in, in the in big departments. It's a big topic to use the cone beam because we can save CT time for the radiology department. The cone beam support, uh, substitutes the, the CT scan. And of course, we have all these malformation parts like ankylosis, arthrosis, or uh, bony uh, pathologies of the TMJ. Um, to plan the osteotomies, distractions, we can um, assess the bone deficit in uh, cleft lip and palate patients or in craniofacial deformities. So now we're coming to Ali, it's a cleft patient, to see it before the um, osteoplasty of the, of the bone gap. Sorry. I need to exercise. Yeah, kind of. Ali. And by the time you get your experience in which indications you get really a value out of, of the 3D imaging, and in which case it's not. And of course, this patient was referred from the orthodontics. And in, before you go in for an osteoplasty in these patients, 11 year old, you clearly have an idea about the teeth. Are there super, super numer numerous teeth around? What about the teeth um, the, uh, they preserve? Or, um, so and the amount of bone needed for the augmentation. So maybe in the axial view we will see it best. Maxima? Here, we see the gap. <coughs> and here we can clearly judge the amount of bone we need for this osteoplasty. And to show also the parents of the patient that this is a gap that will not close in any other way than surgically. So, and for the orthodontics, they have a clear idea about the remaining teeth, about the root shapes, and about the prognosis of these teeth. Okay, very nice. Thank you. So, what we're dreaming of, and I was telling you at the beginning, is orthognatic planning. Although from the theory, it is possible to make all this surgery virtually, to plan everything, and it is really fascinating, but to be honest, this is not everyday routine, in, even in our department. And um, to transfer this to via using guides, using individual plates would also be a solution. And at the end, this is really a question of money. Of course, if we're having um, situations like this, we can, we can place all our points, we can move the skeletal parts, we can see the adjustment of all the measuring points from the orthodontic planning, we see the soft tissue changes about the movements, we can get a, like an optimal occlusion in the new position by a collision detection. So from the technical point of view, this is really possible. We can get out at the end some kind of CAT CAM guides. How to stop it? Oops. Ah, okay, I got it. We can get out some um, CAT CAM gu guides for the surgery. So it is possible. And I think um, Professor Swennen is some of the pioneers in this area advocating this a lot. We do not. Ha we we have only limited personal experience. This was a case we did so. This was a preoperative three D photo. This was a virtual surgery. We did not do the genioplasty at this time, but the rest we did. This was the predicted uh, soft tissue outcome in this case, and these are the conventional X rays. Um, but of course, this was planned um, um, using a chromium three D scan. But we did additionally this one by this time also, and here you see. And here you see the patient pre-op, virtual outcome, and the real outcome. 
okay, it looks similar, but whether this is 100% or not, I, I'm not co totally convinced. But to transfer the 2D also planning to a 3D world will be very fascinating in future. If we have infections, the cone beam offers us a lot of possibility to find the dental cause for the infection. So this is something we are really um, using it also very much. If you look at these patients with an aspergillosis, you can clearly see the amount of infection the patient and the trouble the patient having from this infection. If we have um, this um, Christoph, uh, Jonathan, yes, we can continue with the next one. You can clearly, maybe you can show this um, airway situation in this. <coughs> so you clearly see this uh, obliterated left sinus and the normal right sinus. And there's a nice tool in the software available to, to determine the airways, especially for, for patients with sleep apnea or things like this, but we can show it here in these um, two sinuses, that one sinus is, contains air, the other not. And you clearly see then the three-dimensional visualization about the airspace in this mid-phase of this patient. And on the other side, of course, there's only inflammation. And you can do it maybe in the sagittal, also in the pharynx to show the possibilities for this sleep up here, like we did. Yeah. Again? So, as a very cool machine, I've seen yes, as you feature, but I'm not sure that you got the result of a very aviv, but I think that the volume of the total of a very aviv. זה טוב ל-EMT, לאפרוזן גרון, זה טוב גם לפציינטים שחווים הפסקת נשימה במהלך שינה, זה מה שהוא מדבר עליו, אפשר לראות פה צירויות בקנה הנשימה. question to do an image and if the imaging is done and for sleep apnea um, evaluation this is a certain um, the volume is um, has to be determined the image quality has to be determined and, and the position of the soft tissues of course Yeah, of course. We had this dis discussion in the in the break. We we had this point. Perfect. And then the patient has really radiation exposure. Exactly. Not only the, the floor of the sinus. Yes, perfect point, perfect. Okay, we continue, and I think the next patient will come immediately. Exactly. This is a patient I want to draw your attention specially, and I will show you the imaging at the end. Um, you, we all know this problem of biphosphonate-related uh, necrosis of the jaw. This is, in, in Europe, it is, we see everyday cases, and it's getting more and more. But this one, is an example for the for the tsunami that's coming now to us because this is denosumab. This is not a biphosphonate. This is an antibody, and I will show you. And the patient has this intraoral situation. She underwent um, extraction of teeth six months before. She has no sign of infection. She has some tenderness in this area. 
we did a panoramic view, you see there's something going on and ordered a cone beam scan. And this is the drug, denosumab. She had it five times administered for um, osteoporosis. It is approved for osteoporosis and it's a rank ligand inhibitor antibody. So, and this five times, she got it two and a half years. And now we see the imaging of this case, of this patient. And this is much more severe than biphosphonates. Maybe the, the half time of the drug is also a little bit short. It could be an advantage, but the effect in, as a side effect can be much more problematic. So just look at the, maybe at the axial views. And you see there was no exposed bone in this um, patient. And you see the severe necrosis of the whole mandible, anterior mandibular part. So this is a tsunami that's really already starting, but coming. And it's much more severe than the biphosphonate. Look, look at this bone after five dosages of this drug. Of course, you're not the, the right auditorium for this, um, to draw the attention to the, to the general practitioners in, in uh, medicine, not in dentistry, because they have to take care about the patients when they start the treatment with drugs like this. But this uh, will come to all our departments very impressively. And what to do with a case like this, if the, she gets trouble, it's a resection with, with um, a fibular free flap. In tumor diseases, of course, we can con uh, con use cone beam, but not at the single only um, imaging modality, maybe in cases of ameloblastoma, but not in, in squamous cell carcinoma. And in squamous cell carcinoma, as I told you before, the imaging modality of first choice would be an MRI. But we use cone beam a lot for reconstruction of, of defects if we combine it with an MRI, for example. And I will go through to, um, with some last cases with you to show our experience with this. We had a gentleman some years ago in our department. This was a young gentleman. And of course, we will all agree that this is an amyloblastoma. Yes, it was an amyloblastoma. <laughs> Dr. Lee, one of our senior consultants by this time, when one of my teachers did the surgery. He resected the mandible, of course. He made a free flap from the fibula with this shape, very sporty preparation because there was not much muscle tissue around. And the uh, mandible looks like this, but it survived. It was a living bone transplant. So we were all very proud by this time. And then the story goes on. We did a distraction in the anterior part to reshape our, our fibula. We continue with the distraction in the lateral parts. Of course, again, the bone will grow. So at the end, we get something like a more mandible shape. Then we put the implants in, made the dental rehabilitation, and at the end, the patient was satisfied. But we did three surgeries, yeah. But this is, no. Oh. Nowadays, we want to be better. We want to do it in one surgery, and I will show you how. And this is something you can use even also tomorrow. So planning in general, and this is something we adapted from the implant planning because we are convinced from the planning in implantology, we use it also in these cases. So first, if we sit on the computer with the data, we identify our problems. In three flaps, we can use the donor site approach, anastomosis, and so on, so on. We can design and prefabricate some implants, some plates, and we get some guides. This was originally um, done by Synthes and Materialize, and we did all this virtual workflow with them, and it works. And I will show you a lady, just an example, because she gets a, a similar defect than the uh, guy with the amyloblastoma, 32 years old. On the panoramic view, really nothing to see. There was just a swelling, and the periapical showed something, but not really, um, really very big. We did a resection of this, a big hole, and it was not with safe margins on both sides. So both sides, we had a persistent tumor. It was an osteosarcoma, not a squamous cell carcinoma, osteosarcoma, something very aggressive in this young patient. So we, we made a resection from <coughs> angle to angle, and then we were, had safe margins. Then she got a reconstruction plate and a big free flap. And this is how I met the patient, because then I was uh, coming the head in Hamburg and come back. And this uh, was the situation of the patient. So a defect from angle to angle. And of course, uh, nowadays, we do not want to make a V-shape again, like in the amyloblastoma case, but a five-piece fibula. So this was we were planning virtually. 
and this works. So we got a guide for five pieces of fibula. We get a defect in the, in the mandible the same way. And we can put the individual plate to the, our segments on the leg. So this is still under blood from the leg. So we have a very short ischemia time to not to. And at the end, we have the transplantation like in a puzzle. Everything fits together. So this is really something if, if you're doing this kind of work, you can start tomorrow. It works perfectly to say so. And at the end, this was the post-operative cone beam. And this was the original jaw and the planning. So we were very satisfied and we continued. Of course, swelling was coming and going. We did some minor corrections, reduced the soft tissues. And up to now, the patient is now 23, I think middle, um, uh, some more months without recurrence. And we continue with the dental rehabilitation. But the good news now, if you are used to the guys of Plan Maker, you continue with the same workflow with the guys from Plan Maker because they're doing the same nowadays. This can be also adapted to the upper jaw. This was a patient this osteosis cladiocranialis, originally a disease with too much teeth, too many teeth, but they were all gone. He had some free bone grafts in advance, the exposed bone you can see here, so a very difficult situation. To repeat a free bone graft, you have some scarring with the soft tissues, very challenging. So this is the case, maybe we do it twice a year with a free flap, because then we can leave it open and with granulation tissue. Again, the same remove of the rest with a cone beam, put your fibula inside with three pieces and do the surgery. You get these mini plates individually for the patient on the model. And then you have a, like a puzzle and you put it just in. And at the end, this is the patient two weeks postoperatively. You see this nice granulation tissue. And after some more weeks, you have a scary tissue for the implants coming through very nicely. And this is now, we publish, or are trying to publish this at the moment. We did it in 30 patients. We're doing with Plan Maker. This is a very recent case we did with them. So we have no intro all photo. My resident on Monday, when I come back to Johannesburg, will get a big hit from me because we have only extra all pictures from this patient. But believe me, and you will see, here's the cancer in the mandible located. So we make all the imaging. We send the data to our friends in Finland. We made the, this web meeting with the planning of the resection. We get the guides, we get the individual plate for the situation. Of course, it is a little bit sharp edged because we have segments. This is the individual plate, as thin as possible because this patient will undergo radiotherapy. This patient will go on MRI or CT scanning for follow up. So we want to reduce the level of metal artifacts. And then at the surgery, we had the same again to put everything together. This is the resection. This was the 3D model with the resection lines marked. And then we continue with the free flap and the plate. And at the end, this is the patient one week after surgery. So this works and you can use it immediately and it makes life very much easier because you have two independent teams, one on the leg, one on the head. Everything has his guides and everything at the end fits perfectly together. And with this slide, I want to Thank you for your kind attention.